I hope you heard the power in those words the choir just sang. My name is graven on his hands. My name is written on his heart. My life is hid with Christ on high. Thank you, choir. Our pastor is away this weekend with family and asked me to fill in, and I am not going to be preaching from the lectionary this week. He has asked those of us who are heading up these new areas of ministry in the church to preach on our area. Now, let me recap for you, just in case you might be visiting with us or you've been somewhere off in a far land somewhere, but last May, our pastor reorganized us around a missional focus of church, seven areas, two, the ministry of communication and support, undergird the other five areas. If anyone asks you what we're about as a church, this may be a good way to remember it. We're about five things based on four commands of Jesus. The first command to love God is the ministry of worship. The second one, to love your neighbor as yourself, the ministry of compassion. Go ye into all the world, the ministry of invitation. And the second part of that command, and teach them to obey everything I've commanded you, the ministry of formation. And then we come to the fifth area, love one another, which is the ministry of community, that which I have the privilege of guiding. It is found, this command, in John chapter 13. I'll ask you to turn in your Bibles to that chapter, John 13, verse 34, and I will be there in just a few minutes. I was having coffee last week with a good friend who has moved away from Richmond, and as good friends do, when you're back in the same town, you try to make time to get together to catch up. So she was catching me up with her life, and then she said, Now, tell me about these new responsibilities you have at First Baptist. What is the ministry of community all about? I said, Do you want the long version or the short version? She said, Give me the short one, and I'll ask you some questions. I said, Well, in a nutshell, my job is to help 1,500 people love one another. And without blinking, she said, Oh, that's easy. I said, really? (laughs) Well, just tell me how you would do that. She said, I would tell them to act like Jesus. Well, there you go. A three-word sermon, act like Jesus. We can sing a song and go home, right? (laughs) If only it were that simple. But yet I think it should be, shouldn't it? Let's see what Jesus said in this command. John The Gospel of John, chapter 13, verses 34 and 35. A new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this all men will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. I remember I had preached on this passage a few years back. And I remember saying that what intrigued me about this passage then were the words new commandment. What was new about the command to love? And it was about the quality of that love. That Jesus was speaking of agape love, which means self-giving, self-sacrificing kind of love. So when I went back to look at the scripture this week in preparation for today... I ask myself another question when I looked at this passage. Why? Why on the last night before Jesus was going to be crucified on a cross, the last night he spent with his disciples, why was this the thing that was most on his heart to share with them? To love one another. I think it's because Jesus knew that in order for his death to mean anything, in order for the message of his self-sacrificial love to others to matter, it was going to be shown to the world not by what these disciples taught or said, but how they loved one another. He 
He says, by this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Jesus knew that they were going to need one another. Once he was gone, they were going to be dependent upon that love. Many of you know I grew up on a farm outside of Florence, South Carolina. My family of six lived in a very small farmhouse in the middle of tobacco fields and peanut fields and cotton fields. Now, my dad was not a farmer, but his brother was. And we lived on this little dirt road off the main highway. Two out of six of my dad's brothers and all three of his sisters lived off this little dirt road. It was kind of the family neighborhood. We called it Turnerville. Um, in fact, we named the road, the little dirt road, Turner Road. As you can imagine, six people in a very small house, a very small living room, small kitchen, three small bedrooms, and I had to share a bedroom with my sister. Well, we would have our squabbles here and there, but as we got older, she became a teenager, 13, I was 10, we started fighting even more over small things, sharing space, sharing things. And I remember at one point, it got to the point where we took some masking tape and we taped a center line all the way down the room and dared one another to cross over. Well, every time my mother would hear us arguing, she would come into the room and she would say this. You know, the Bible says that if you cannot love your brother and sister that you can see, how can you love God that you cannot see? Now, y'all need to make up because one day you're going to need one another. And I never said this out loud, but I always thought it and probably muttered it under my breath. And my sister would be a lot easier to love if I, if I could not see her. <laughs> Don't you think that Jesus knew that as soon as he was gone, as soon as he was not seen anymore, that the love that his disciples would have for one another was going to be the glue to hold them together. Don't you think that Jesus knew that as soon as he was gone, that human nature would begin to settle in the human heart, the heart that doubts and argues, the heart that becomes jealous? Things would start overriding the love that he had been talking about. Do you realize that most of the New Testament, other than the Gospels and the Acts of the Church, are letters written by Paul to believers in churches who were arguing and fighting amongst themselves? Instead of moving the cause of Christ forward, they were spending more time just battling amongst themselves. And they had forgotten what it meant to be and live as a Christian family. And Paul would write to them to encourage them, to remind them of that love. At one point to the church in Corinth, he writes a whole chapter about just that, love. You heard it read, parts of it, uh, a few minutes ago. 1 Corinthians 13 Allow me this morning, if you would, to paraphrase this for our church. First Baptist Church, you may have spirit-filled worship services with excellent preaching. You may have the most talented musicians and choirs. You may have wonderful, knowledgeable teachers who teach the Bible every Sunday morning. You may have ministries that reach out into the community and make a difference in the lives of many. You may send missionaries on mission all around the world, but if you do not have love, it means nothing. 